How'd you like to listen to .NET Rocks with no ads? Easy. Become a patron. For just $5 a month, you get access to a private RSS feed where all the shows have no ads. $20 a month will get you that and a special .NET Rocks patron mug. Sign up now at patreon.netrocks.com. Hey, Carl and Richard here. As you may have heard, NDC is back, offering their incredible in-person conferences around the world. NDC Porto is happening October 16th through the 20th. Go to ndcporto.com to register. And check out the full lineup of conferences at ndcconferences.com. Hey, guess what? It's .NET Rocks. I'm Carl Franklin. And I'm Richard Campbell. And we are still at the Dev... Uh, what is it? The Developer Festival. Festival in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen. Mm-hmm. Copenhagen. And uh, I don't know about you, but you've been here longer than I have. You and Stacy were here for a while. Yeah, we kinda, we got in on the weekend. Yeah. So we got a chance to do a little tourist thing. We went yeah, I didn't that. do any tourist things this I went time. Up the, we went up to Helsingborg to the castle that supposedly was where Hamlet is set. That is so cool. Yeah, it's not that big of a big castle. Maybe big enough for a big whiner to be end up written about by Shakespeare. <laughs> but, you know, just a whiner. <laughs> that's funny. And then we took the ferry across to Sweden because that's something you can do. That's cool. I've only taken the train. Yeah. Yeah. But they made me put it back. Ah. So that's what happened. Mm, that happens. Uh, anyway, um, uh, <laughs> Annie Talvasto is here. But before we talk to her, we're going to spin the crazy music for Better No Framework. Go ahead. <laughs> What do you got? Well, this came across my desk a little while ago, and I thought it was interesting, and I tried it. So the latest Adobe Premiere Pro, or Adobe Premiere, for video editing, mm-hmm. has this new workspace for text-based editing. Interesting. Text-based editing. Uh, so what you do is you, you have to tell it to transcribe the videos that come in. And it's great if you just have one person talking, right? It's not so good if you have... Multiple audio tracks and video tracks that are synced up and stuff. But here's what it does. It transcribes it. And then you go into this workspace and you see the sentences on the left. And you can highlight part of the sentence, what they said. And it adds that to the timeline. Interesting. So you can do your cuts and edits and stuff just by highlighting the words. And now you've got jump cuts where you're just highlighting the stuff that they said that you want yeah, and none of the stuff that you don't want. Well, half the time, that's where you're lining up the cut anyways, just as someone starts speaking the word. Right. Although I do like the other voice starts speaking, screen fades in afterward. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But, but what's it's you on the timeline, you can, you can mess around with it. Yeah, for sure. But this is a good way to get stuff on the timeline. My problem is, you know, when we do videos um, for my other podcasts, it's great if it's just me. Mm-hmm. But if there's two people talking... Now you've got two video files, two audio transcripts, and you can't sync them. Like right. there's no you. You basically do jump cuts, mm-hmm. you know, and then they get out of sync, and now you're screwed. So, <laughs> so it, like I said, it's really cool for. Um, and I usually don't push, you know, commercial products and things like that. Adobe but, products, but but you know anybody who's doing serious uh, creation, you know, creator content has the Adobe Suite. Probably. And, you know, this is just one more tool you can use. Awesome. Yeah. And it's just neat that they are working on things. Yeah. You know, for a long time, it was easy to just say Adobe was where good software went to die. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was particularly angry with them about their, you know, the PDF thing, right? Yeah. I mean, the Adobe PDF reader is like a virus. Yeah. At Pl- one point. A plague. It was a plague, and you couldn't get rid of it. And now you don't need it, of course, because right. the browsers just show PDFs, but... But yeah, no, I don't want to subscribe to your thing and shut up. I don't need a new update yeah. of the Adobe PDF reader. It's a PDF <laughs> reader. Just yeah, stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> but, but let's face it, fa- you know, Photoshop, Premiere Pro. Audition. Play, yeah, Audition. Just These are ex- excellent some products. of the best of the best. And uh, yeah. and hopefully they keep them healthy. Yeah. And they grab Figma, too. I think they grabbed I think they did, yeah. 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 For better or worse. That's it. All right, man. That's cool. Yeah. Who's talking to us today, Richard? Uh, I grabbed a comment off of show 1723, the one we did back in uh, January 2021 with our friend Tom Kirkhoff, and we were talking about containers in Azure. So naturally, mm-hmm. we talked about Kubernetes because it's mm-hmm. kind of unavoidable. And uh, Karthikeyan 
uh, Vic had this comment. He says, hey, this is a great show with great insight. I'd like to add my two cents about when to choose Azure Functions versus Kubernetes. Hmm. I had the same question where I needed to run machine learning workloads in Azure. And, of course, this is a couple of years ago because, let's face it, there's a lot of ways to do machine learning yeah. workloads these days. Yeah. That's changed, too. Azure Functions have a time of about 10 minutes. And even when you choose a premium plan or an app service plan, it has the limitation of not being completely serverless and a limit of only 50 to 200 instances at a time. Mm. By choosing Kubernetes, I was able to spend more nodes and also taint the pods to different high CPU nodes. So I think he's actually assigning them to high end yeah. nodes uh, based on the job without a time up problem. I need at least 500 nodes spinning up to 5,000 pods to mm. complete the workloads faster. Wow. Kubernetes is not only completely serverless. When you use the virtual kubelet, you, do, you do need to pay for at least one minimum node and a load balancer. And if you're running on one, you probably shouldn't be using Kubernetes anyway. The yeah. whole point is scale, right? Right, right. Uh, main point is, is using uh, Kubernetes using Helm, you can divide the pod's memory and CPU, which was not possible in the Azure functions for variable work. Yeah, and Azure functions tend to go to sleep and some lucky customer is going to hit the jackpot and have to wait for them to wake up. Yeah, again. but you know, it makes the point, uh, functions is so abstract, yeah. you don't get to specify the performance of a nope. function. That's not a thing. Yep. Where Kubernetes is that tier down where it's like, oh, no, I need you to make this thing with lots of muscle because when I'm about to chuck at it, it's going to take a while. Yeah, more and more control. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you trade some complexity mm -hmm. or some control. Yep. Uh, so, Karthik Kenyon, thank you so much for your comment. And a copy of Music to Code by is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code by, write a comment on the website at .net rocks com or on the Facebooks. We publish every show there. And if you comment there and I read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code by. And you can follow us on Twitter or X or whatever the hell they call it these days. That's fine. But uh, we're both on Mastodon, and I'm on Blue Sky now, too. So because I have so many places, you can just go to carlfranklin.com, and right there at the top, you can see all my social media stuff. All the medias. Yeah. And you are I'm where? Rich, I'm Rich Campbell at Mastodon.social. I'm actually pretty much Rich Campbell everywhere. Everywhere. So it's not hard to find me. Yeah. Oh, good. Follow us there. Yeah. Send us a toot. Send us a tweet. Whatever makes you happy. Okay. Let me introduce Annie. Uh, Annie Talvasto is an international technology speaker, CNCF ambassador. Acronym, what does CNCF stand for? Cloud Native Computing Foundation. All right. You're an ambassador there, an Azure MVP, and specialist in Kubernetes and open source. Annie hosts and produces the Cloud Gossip podcast and has been a co-organizer of Kubernetes and CNCF Finland meetup since 2017. She has worked at various tech companies from cloud startups to enterprises uh, and spoken at tech conferences on multiple continents, including KubeCon. Uh, do we say KubeCon? KubeCon? I can't remember. Whatever you want to say. Right. I usually say KubeCon, but I, everyone uses different I words. I like KubeCon. It. it makes me happy. Oh, that's right. even better. KubeCon. <laughs> <laughs> cloud Native Con. Uh, Microsoft Build and Ignite, NDC, KCDC, Global Azure, Future Tech, and more. During her career, she's spoken to more than 30,000 developers at user groups, meetings, and conferences. Wow. That's a lot of pizza. That's a lot. It's actually even... <laughs> <laughs> There's it, a lot of herring in your case. It is. Yeah. Uh, it is a lot more than that nowadays. I've stopped sure. kind of calculating yeah. after that point. I yeah. was like, whatever. It's some number. It becomes a silly number or something. Yeah, exactly. So, i just got to say this. My, my mother's family comes from the Swedish part of Finland. Oh. Oh, so, yeah, nice. I got the Finnish and the Swedish in me. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's good. So I'm going to get borscht, borscht, borky, borky, borscht with it. <laughs> Not jiggy. Really? I don't know. Okay. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm jet lagged. <laughs> I have had more coffee than water today and I'm still tired. There you go. Uh, so what are we talking about? We're talking about Kubernetes and we're talking about tooling? Yeah. Or just the whole... We're just going to have a conversation about Kubernetes. First of all, what did you think of the comment? The comment? Uh, I think, actually, that's at the gist of, like, the stuff that I've been thinking about recently. Like, mm -hmm. there's multiple levels that you can kind of think about Kubernetes nowadays. Yeah. You can obviously think about it in a very practical terms of, like, okay, what tooling do you choose right now? Mm. Or how should you um, define or, or, like, how should your teams work? And also, obviously, on the level of, like, what are the trends currently within what tools are um, teams choosing? Mm. Or what are the different trends in, like, how do organizations organize themselves and whatnot? Mm. But then there's the other level of think about Kubernetes or, like, infrastructure management in general, yeah. which is, like, what's the next thing mm -hmm. after Kubernetes? Or you can also usually think about, okay, what was before Kubernetes? 
which can Virtual usually machines. yeah exactly and you yeah. can then kind of usually because I, I think there's really good sayings around like to know the future you have to know the past yeah. and whatnot yeah. so you can think about those kind of things and I think the comment is actually at the really good center of you know Kubernetes is essentially right now the de facto um, way to do infrastructure sort and, and manage scale, the yeah, scalable push. exactly I mean yeah. I'm worried reading this comment at not to check Carthy Canyon under the bus, but he like he wrote it two years ago. Yeah. And this is still pretty young tech. Mm. Yeah. But also now I think all the people who were very early on in Kubernetes, they're already not moving on. I don't want to say that everyone's moving on from Kubernetes. It mm -hmm. will very much stay, but I think there's gonna be another abstraction level mm -hmm. added on top of Kubernetes. And as you can see, there's functions, there's serverless and whatnot. What's likely going to be going uh, kind of exactly not next, but it usually you can see it in the past that technology goes from abstraction level to the next sure. abstraction level mm -hmm. and whatnot. And then, I mean, I know it's about from talking yeah. to folks inside of Microsoft, like Azure Functions ha is runs in containers. Yeah, you mm -hmm. don't own those containers. You have no ability yeah. control mm -hmm. as it is, but that's how they do it. There's no magic there. They're just abstracting it away from you. Exactly. You think there's like an AI version that can control Kubernetes in the future coming? You For know, sure. Some sort of uh, something you can just talk to? Yeah, you know, for sure. I Star would... Trek Enterprise computer <laughs> style. <laughs> exactly. I think for sure. Obviously, it remains to be then seen what goes mainstream, what's get adopted mm. widely, and what's actually at the good balance of like, okay, as you said, there was the challenges there around, you know, the standardization and then the kind of flexibility to do what you actually need to do for your your case. So there's yeah. going to be obviously questions around that. But I think, I think in general, the next generation, particularly with this current like AI and MLOps mm. hype, I think mm -hmm. someone's definitely going to go for it. Yeah. Alexa, it's my cluster gone. to 5 million instances. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but the point being, you don't need to know that number, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You, when I think about a, a machine learning model sitting over top of a, uh, of a container infrastructure, like, and again, going back to the comment, it's, hey, you want this level of performance, so I'm going to tweak the shape of these these uh, containers to increase their performance and mm. make more of them as necessary. Yeah. Like, that's getting beyond elasticity to some really intelligent behavior right. on how to optimize an infrastructure to get to sort of a, uh, uh, a contractual deliverables. Like we're going to keep all these transactions under a second. If that means I have more instances, I have more instances. That means I use higher levels of compute. I use higher levels of compute. If I can, yeah. if I can have a natural language processor that will write my YAML for me, mm. that's going to be a happy day. Because that's going to be a happy day. Just, except for that part where it misses one indent. Oh God, torch yeah, it. that's <laughs> true. I like that. And that's <sighs> really great. Exactly. Um, and also look at the stratum now in the past couple of years of the. The Kubernetes services. Yeah. That, so you're not standing up your own VMs to host Kubernetes anymore. You've kind of got this pre-configured piece. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. That, it, that has been also, I think, part of the abstraction journey for Kubernetes in general. Because, um, okay, if you want to do plain Kubernetes, mm -hmm. you know, go for it. There's a lot of material. There's yep. books, Kubernetes the hard way. But I think there is <laughs> it's in there already it's kubernetes the hard way and you're not you're not saying that casually yeah <laughs> there is a hard way to do kubernetes exactly so knock yourself out yeah 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 and that is the actual book name um right. so also then obviously like if you want to make your life easier and also this is the standard nowadays also mm -hmm. um is to go with the managed service or managed kubernetes route which is usually can take the form of AKS, GKE, EKS, mm. one of these from the hyperscalers, or there's obviously a lot of local ones as well mm. as smaller ones, or a combination of, um, you know, managed service with um, consultancy or service mm. providers then helping you with some of the stuff and whatnot. Yeah. And obviously adding all the add-ons that you need on top of the managed services and whatnot. But I mean, it might, might be a bit of a contradiction of terms, but is there an on-prem Kubernetes managed service? Like, they, a set of software or tooling just to help you the same way that these managed services do in the cloud? Well, the, usually the premise of, um, of all of these managed services is with like the premise of Kubernetes is that you should be able to use it on prem as well if needed. Right. I mean, that was the whole claim to fame. Exactly. Why it, why it won. Uh, so to an extent, you should be able to do it normally, but there are also then kind of add ons and extra services that you can use there as well. I would say that likely OpenShift, for example, has a quite a good serving there. Mm -hmm. Like I work for a company nowadays that we actually somewhat specialize in providing OpenShift on premises, right. which is essentially a version of Kubernetes on premises, for mm -hmm. example, for uh, highly regulated industries that need the on-prem 
um, side and of things. And that's the Red Hat product, OpenShift. Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. but it's on. It's Kubernetes under the hood. Yeah. Okay. Now that's interesting. It's just, and it's just sort of recognizing that there are ways to approach this. There's different layers of tooling on that. Of course, we immediately associate Red Hat with Linux stuff. Yeah. But then, in general, you're making Linux workloads in Kubernetes containers. Yeah. Right? Like, it is. I know we're supposed to be able to do it with Windows. I just don't see anybody doing it. Yeah. <laughs> There's always something. It's always, to be honest, uh, it's the word, the sentence that we all know. It depends. Right. Sure. Yeah. Works very well. <laughs> so, like, exactly what you need or what's the setup and what's the kind of mix of services or products that you need. Mm-hmm. And it depends on what's the best and what not. But there's options out there for yeah. sure. There's no one right way for any of this. Stuff. Yeah. I I feel like the the advantage the reason Kubernetes sort of won in the orchestration wars, I air quoted that, because we had DCOS and Mesosphere and like a, some of these other things, was the ecosystem. Yeah. That it and I and I wonder if that's just like it got to a critical mass where it was now worthwhile to build better tools around it. It just became easier. Although I would argue when Azure and Amazon made Kubernetes services, and it's like, and of course GCP was there first. It's like, okay, well, game over. Yeah, <laughs> you don't think it, maybe because the people at Google are freaking smart, smarter well, than the other people, <laughs> and made a better product. Well, like, I mean, nominally that guy is Brendan Burns, who these mm. days works for Microsoft, yep. right? Mm. And the last conversations we had with him, he's kind of thinking beyond containers too. Like that's a wicked smart guy who's always thinking about the next yeah. layer of problems. Yeah. That's where they're early on um, keeping these folks at the moment. Yeah. They are kind mm. of. But there is honestly a lot to do with the current set of tooling and whatnot in Kubernetes as well, obviously, because as kind of mentioned here already, it is the way that containers are managed at mm-hmm. scale. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider there as well. Um, for sure. What's your usual set of tools if you're setting up a Kubernetes instance? Like, I mean, I can think of Helm, yeah, but I know there's dozens. Well, that always depends again yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a <laughs> bummer to keep repeating <laughs> it. But truly, I think, well, Helm is, I think, a really good place to start mm-hmm. always. I think nowadays, if, if you are moving in the Kubernetes circles, Helm and Kubernetes are quite often, um, like, inseparable like you kind of don't do any, any more than you than you develop in dotnet without using nuget right like it's the package yeah. manager you use a package manager your life will be better exactly mm. but there was like a few like i was just to part in a, like a quick interview like you know on these kind of rapid fire questions mm-hmm. and then someone did like within that interview said said that you know they wanted to sunset uh helm and i was like oh i need to like find out more like what's <laughs> what's the reasoning here but but there's always some hot takes and whatnot so who knows why yeah, because there's another one of those things that's got the network effect, like the yeah. fact that the packages all route through Helm. Like, yeah. why would you try to disrupt that? That's a hard thing to get into place in the first place. Yeah, and I guess there's usually, like, there's new services, and there's, like, um, if you look at the CNCF um, mm-hmm. offering, well, not the CNCF offering, the foundation has, like, a lot of projects, open source projects underneath this umbrella. Right. There's pretty much, like, if there's one way to do something, there's definitely another project to right. do a bit in a bit of a different way. Yeah. Like there's gazillion ways and there's stuff that, that divides opinion that, that for some cases it's really good and some cases then some people find it lacking and whatnot, like cross plane and whatnot. Um, so there's a lot of things you can choose from. So I, I would say that likely, yes, that yes, I would say if you're starting your Kubernetes journey or midway point, Helm is probably a really good companion and good package management. But likely there's also, as said before, it depends. There's probably something else somewhere that maybe really good for your specific scenarios and whatnot. Where do tools like Terraform and Pulumi come into play with, with uh, Kubernetes? Yeah, well, they are infrastructure as code, uh, which is then a bit of a different thing. Mm-hmm. Well, not, you can kind of use it in companion with Kubernetes. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you are looking for an infrastructure as a code, um, like project, writer product, that is more Kubernetes focused, then you would go with Crossplane, likely, gotcha. which is the CNCF project. Um, Crossplane. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It's by Upbound, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Cool. And so it does does what those things do, but it's more Kubernetes focused. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, that's cool. Rather than go out to another, I mean, there is a, a Kubernetes plugin for Terraform. Mm, yeah. So I mean, if you're used to working in Terraform and you're moving into Kubernetes, the plugin means you don't have to change. Yeah. Mm. But again, there's all this whole. If you're starting from scratch, why would you do that when there's more Kubernetes centric tooling? For and that? it's all a command line 
thing yeah. anyway, right? Yeah, if you just, know one, you know. It's not exactly. just words. <laughs> and crossplane is relatively new and you know there's nothing bad with new tooling and there's nothing mm. inherently like unsecure or whatnot yeah. but that is always the terraform is more of a standard yeah. so that's always then you have to consider right. these things if you are making infrastructure choices mm-hmm. um mm. but i think if i remember correctly don't quote me on it too much but i think crossplane is incubating level at cncf so cncf has different levels for mm. project maturity right. they are incubating which means that they are not graduated so not fully fully you know full-fledged for right. every scenario in production but likely at the incubating level you're quite safe and good to go on yeah. so in the cncf in june of 2020 it is in the incubating level so you yes. called it perfect yeah. mm, wow. <laughs> and, and what does that mean to be an incubating level um so uh, projects if, well they can start at any level obviously mm-hmm. if they come outside the foundation but the the life cycle if someone were to start a new project they would probably you know start it first and have some level of idea and traction or like right. you know something mm-hmm. out there and then they would generally probably join in the sandbox level which is like that so that's your intro exactly we're yeah. just figuring out what we want to be when we yeah. grow up so there's a lot of sandbox project nowadays mm-hmm. uh i think last time i checked probably talking like 70 or so Um, and that's a tier that got introduced a few years ago um, so it didn't exist originally but that's essentially like the sandbox name kind of tells some part of that it's like a place to try out new things some you're of them will become big some of them will maybe trickle down and die and whatnot but there's yeah, like you're a, gonna get some scratchy things in delicate yeah. areas be careful yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like a playground yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. so yeah. you're experimenting yeah, yeah yeah you can try out new things it's more kind of you know you have to do a bit more due diligence yourself if you want to take something into production likely but you know yeah. there's a good stuff there but incubating is a little more mature. yeah then you get actually a bit more because when you move between the levels there's you know security checks architecture there's requirements for having having um, processes within the project so that, you know, mm-hmm. every like scenario, for example, if maintainers become uh, unavailable and whatnot, like what's the contingency plans right. for everything as well as like... So the, uh, the, the development team's a little more mature too. Yeah. You have more than one person accepting pull requests. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of yeah. I'm and, on vacation. No coach changes. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and also there's uh, like um, in that vein, there's uh, uh, like requirement for how many maintainers and whatnot or like different companies so that it's not like a one vendor only project, yeah, project and whatnot. From, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, like so that. then you move to the incubating phase which is just like checks around these topics mm-hmm. so that's why you can know that okay likely the, it's gone through security checks and whatnot yeah. and then when you move to the graduated phase which is and i think there's the incubating level again i don't remember exact numbers but like let's say 20 30 usually or something max it's much smaller than the than the sandbox level but then when you move to the graduated level a few years ago on then it was only kubernetes for example in right. the graduated level now we're talking maybe 10 to 15 20 even if if there's been a lot of graduating greater cater graduated le- recently so there's nowadays it's kind of picking up speed mm-hmm. but this is also a sign of kubernetes maturing yeah, 25 projects now in the- oh it's so many in graduated, yeah, the graduated there's been- list. and the ones you recognize harbor and helm yeah and- that's yeah. the big ones yeah yeah so yeah, exactly. So uh, I need to catch up my numbers. I think I last checked them like half a year ago. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's moving quite fast nowadays, honestly. But it mm-hmm. is, the scene is maturing. Um, it is widespread adoption. So it just means that the, all the tooling is really getting mature as well. So, the, yeah, the graduated projects are your lowest risk. Yeah, exactly. You, this is mature software. Go ahead and use yeah. it. I mean, I'm, I don't know that I'd be all that shy about incubated software either. Like, there's already people yeah. out there working on it. Like, that, that's, For sure, yeah. That's pretty interesting. But exactly. It's, it's nice to see that the CNCF has gotten so sophisticated in it, how to manage an ecosystem, how to grow yeah. it and, and and move it forward so that mm. place, people have a way to have confidence using it without being experts. Exactly. Yep. And I think it's really good because, for example, um, for Kata, uh, I don't rem- know like, the, like, remember the exact timeline, but it took them a while. Like, if you go from incubating to graduate, it might take like half a year to a year or, sure. or something. Um, because 
it is extensive. Like you need to go through the checks and you need to pass and you need to really kind of get through it all. So if you, if you are looking at projects and they are at the graduated level, I said here, they like, you know, you can trust them. You yeah. can, you know, that the things are being thought up and whatnot. And, mm-hmm. and like Kubernetes was the first one to go to graduated. And I think there's, you know, things like Prometheus, Opa and like mm-hmm. whatnots and Helm initially as well. And well, I have another question, but I think it's about time for a break. So we'll be right back after these very important messages. Hey, Carl here. We have some news from our sponsor, Text Control. They just released version 32, can you believe it, of their document processing library, which includes new core functionality like document footnotes, SVG export, and much more. Integrate document editing, signing, collaboration, and PDF processing into your ASP.NET Core and Angular applications with TX Text Control. Powerful libraries let your developer teams focus on their core competencies while Text Control handles your digital document processing. Check out all the new features and see the technologies in action by visiting the live demo at demos.textcontrol.com. And we're back. We're in Denmark with Annie Talvasto. And some ping pong going on in the background. I'm, <laughs> you're listening to .NET Rocks. I'm Carl Franklin. And I'm Richard Cavill. And uh, so I have a question for you. So you're yeah. with a customer, and they're interested in Kubernetes. And, you know, obviously the first thing you do is you find out if it's a good fit for what yeah. they want to do. So what are the typical, you know, what's your benchmark? What's your, like, you know, what is it that you want to do? Like, how big do you need to scale? What are the questions that you ask to determine whether Kubernetes, Kubernetes and Containers in general hmm. might be overkill for this company. That's a good question. Uh, usually, so there might be a good number out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it depends. Uh, I'm getting back to that all the time. Uh, but right. also, uh, usually if it's at a certain scale, then it's good to go. What if they say we have a hundred customers now, but we're going to have 10 million customers <laughs> next year? By our, you know, analysis or whatever. And, you know, do you, what do you say then? Well, if they want to invest the resources and they want to go for it, I don't see an issue with it either. Like if they want to, and if they're, you know, I don't know, profit calculations for managing their infrastructure team and the time they can spend on it and productivity and whatnot all matches. I think it's fine. And to be honest, there's like, there's levels to it. And I I don't do customer facing work on a daily Mm -hmm. basis nowadays. Um, so I don't know, um, I can't like give you a customer example out of the top of my head right now, but I did recently speak with a startup who is about 20 people, 30 mm-hmm. people still, so relatively stealth. Mm-hmm. So very mm-hmm. early on, um, even in the cryptocurrency field. Um, so very early on and whatnot. Right. Um, and they actually had, uh, so I didn't speak with the CTO themselves. It was just like, actually I think it was, but anyhow, he didn't have all the answers to my questions because I got very interested because he said they are running plain Kubernetes. Hmm. And I was like, that's funky. And like, why would in, you do that? In this, <laughs> this day and age. But hmm. for them, apparently it had provided a really good, um, um, set of, uh, environment and tooling because they wanted to stay as, Ben, like Ben cloud and vendor looking neutral as possible. Right, and they I wanted see. to do like switching between the clouds and whatnot. And I was kind of thinking, mm, this sounds, interesting um but if it works for them hey it works yeah, for them yeah. you know right. yeah no, i've talked to lots of folks who think they want to be cloud yeah. independent yeah but never actually do it uh and even when they try it's like it's way harder than you think it's hard and it's expensive yeah. and you know and you're of trying to value yeah you're trying to predict the future that may or may not yeah exactly. my, my automatic reaction when you say oh we went with bare metal kubernetes is so you had a person yeah. Who knew their way around that or wanted to know their way around it. And that's the real reason you went that direction. Mm. Like in the end, I think it does come down to individuals and what they want to work in. Mm. Exactly. I don't know that why anybody picks a container strategy up front. It's more of, uh, we're building, we've gotten the shape of the software. Now we're looking at the implementation and this is really an implementation detail. Right. Like yeah. the, to be elastic and that's really to control cost. That I'm only when I, I'm only going to scale when it's going to make me more money and I'm going to wind it down when I'm not, which pretty much means I have a cloud vendor. Yeah. Because if I own the hardware, it's already paid for. Yeah. Like, what am I caring about? The additional electricity consumption? I don't Bandwidth think that's that bill. big of a deal. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we we talked about this lately on .NET Rocks with various other guests about, um, you know, over-architecture, right? Yeah. You know, if a company is just starting out and they have delusions of grandeur or or maybe wishes or desires, you know, in a perfect world, we're going to scale so big, so we better start right now with, you know, with uh, with this thing. But if you build your applications in such a way that things are separated anyway, Mm. You know, whether it's even by DLL or by service or by just sections of your application that you can carve off when you need to, um, you know, maybe that's the time to, to think about. Oh, yeah, oh, definitely. And I think it's honestly, uh, I'm here saying, oh, go for it if you want yeah. and if you have the budget and whatnot. But truly, I think the, one of the number one things to keep in mind is not to over engineer, yeah. not to overextend, to keep things as simple as possible for like, well, not as long as possible because whenever you add a new add on, a new CNC project, a new whatever, you're adding another level of dependency. Mm-hmm. And then, particularly in these days when you really do have to consider um, security, that's always another thing to check up on. That's always another thing to think about. Yeah. So, I would advise always to stay cautious in that way that, like, actually have a think before you add on yeah. something. And I think that's a big part of it. And so I go around conferences talking about like a lot of different CNCF projects. So mm. I'm the person who was like, ooh, Kata this, Falco that, Helm this, try out everything. <laughs> do all the things. <laughs> but truly, don't do all the things. Like right, do the yeah. things that matter to you, what well, makes sense for you. And architecture is the place to start, yeah. right? You know, if you keep everything in silos and loosely coupled, then it's easy to to chip things away and move things yeah. apart. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and you don't, yeah, then you can afford to be wrong, too. Yeah. It's like, yeah. hey, we spent a week tinkering with Kubernetes to try and deal with a couple of these issues, and, you know, did it work for us or didn't it? It was another way to go about it. Can right. I peel some of this code out, run it in, in, in uh, lambdas or as Azure Functions? And how do we feel about that? Like, right. There's just a, when you, the, we, all these discussions we've had about architecture, mm-hmm. but really architecture should give you choice. Mm. Yes. That, be you flexible. Can. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and that you don't have to predict the future and you don't have to guess how things are going to go, that you can respond to the, your, your business demand. Right. And just move things as you need to move them. It doesn't, we're not telling you, hey, you know, you're, you're delusional if you think you're going to be successful. We're not saying that. Yeah, we're yeah. just saying that, you know, you don't have to spend the money up front if you don't need to. And if you are successful, great. If you architect things correctly, you'll be able to, you'll be able to switch to when, scale you need to. when you need to scale. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it, it is also about, you know, don't think about tooling that you need. Think about what processes do you need or do you have already mm-hmm. and what, uh, what is your architecture and what is your application and everything. Mm-hmm. And then fit the tooling to that not the other way around. Right. Which I think it's such an easy thing to say and right. just, like it makes sense. But it is tendency, I think, in technical field to be like, oh, that's the cool new thing. I want that. Let's do that. Yes. Whatever it is. Which is, you know, I get that. That's cool. As I said, I'm the person who's excited about all the new yeah. things and I yeah, am yeah. advocating <laughs> for them. But it is also, you know, you should start with your needs, your yeah. processes, your team. First. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I do feel like there was a period here uh where people were kubernetes because it had a good name yeah right? like they got overexcited mm-hmm. with like we will kubernetes all the things <laughs> and and then got in there and went oh ah, this isn't free <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah a bit too complex and mm-hmm. you it's why i'm really starting to feel more and more as i talking to folks who are working with this stuff it's like you'll know you'll need it when you need it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. When you have that problem of how do I scale this? Why, mm-hmm. why are we strangling, you know, struggling at this point? And, you know, I'm watching the logs and we're getting more and more transactions and they start to fall off and mm-hmm. I turn up the knobs on the cloud and it ain't handling. Right? Yep. <laughs> like yeah. You're, you're yep. stuck. And now that's that architectural conversation and, and mm-hmm. do I pull things around and be able to scale them differently? Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a lot of sense. Are there, are there other tool space? Like we talked about, about the package management side. Uh, you know, how do you set up that elasticity well? Like I always worry about the administrative overhead of these systems of automating the scale and, and being able to see we aren't impacting our customers badly. Mm. Like that we can see that the system is scaling up and scaling down to maintain a level of performance for the users. Well, I think there's a, well, there's a lot of tooling that you could use 
from from CNCF, for example, or mm. whatnot, which is usually quite a lot of them are like you know the de facto to use with Kubernetes, but there's a lot outside of the foundation as well. And obviously, like after you maybe have package management, you have to think about monitoring. Right. Um. So Prometheus, for example, is classic. is classic there yeah. with like Grafana and whatnot, which is a big one as well. And I think it's also actually really important to keep the classics in mind. Um, because as project mature, they might lose some of the, like the cool factor in that way, mm -hmm. but they still are the backbone of, of, of all of these, um, infrastructure teams and whatnot. I thought that, uh, that monitoring is where you want to innovate anyway. Like, you know, when you yeah. want to throw a monitor, show me the stuff that's important. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't exactly. make me think too hard about it. Well, and it's, yeah. you know, Prometheus has good templates yeah. for pulling the information that's going to be important. And Grafana has. Excellent dashboards yeah. for surfacing that information where you could look at it right away and go, I need to pay attention to this or everything's fine. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's very funny that just like, where do you want to innovate? Yeah, what do you want exactly. to do something new on? What do you, what do you need fancy new software? Like, do you, is there a possibility that a dashboard is going to make a difference yeah. beyond just having a dashboard? Yeah. Exactly. And particularly in the open source community, I always try to kind of sneak in and remind of like, if you are, for example, happily using Prometheus Helm or whatnot, you're thinking, oh, it's such a big project. So it's all good. It's open source. It's all running. But actually some of the big projects might be the ones that need maintainers or mm -hmm. contributions oh, yeah. as well. Because as I said, like if it's no longer the, like the new cool kit on the blog, mm. you might actually need a bit like more attention and, and sometimes, sometimes. Um, to get contributions because also there's a lot of users. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of organizations tapping into it. Yeah. So you also have a lot of <laughs> help requests, support and whatnot needed as well as new feature requests and everything. So then actually contributing to the old projects is super crucial as well to keep them up and running and keeping them vital. Keeping them healthy because yeah. they are important. Yeah. Um, I mean, the another recurring conversation for us is healthy open source community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, obviously... The, the found, the cloud foundation has this financial model integrated mm. into it. If you're in that, in that system of incubating and so forth, there is compensation in there. Where are they getting their money from? Like, how is that working? I don't know how the foundation. Yeah. Um, well, I don't have the full list of sources right. for their funding, but truly, um, I would say that likely membership fees are probably are a, big a big part, part of, of it. Yeah, yeah. A big chunk of it. Because there is, um, if you look at the CNCF page for members, it's a long list. Yeah. Like, it is a hefty list of really big companies. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the big level of sponsorships, it's, it's also going to cost you. Big uh, tickets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It also makes sense if you're a bigger company and you have bigger pockets and you're actually using a chunk of the software that the foundation has. It makes sense to contribute back to it yeah. uh, financially as Finan well. Financially as well as dev resources. Yeah, like exactly. It's always good to contribute in some way. Yeah. And I, and I would hope that sort of mid-band companies, too, get into the habit of, hey, you depend on this software, support it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, in, exactly. In some useful way. Um, it is, I mean, the real question is, do you, do you allocate dev resources or just send money? Yeah. Like both, <laughs> both are reasonable. Because, I mean, the upside to de allocating dev resources is, I want this feature yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go build it and contribute to the project. Exactly. And the re most recent conversations are like generally when I nowadays talk with maintainers, actually the thing that they usually ask for likely is financial investment in terms of our investment and dev resources. Right. So, okay, you know, yeah. if you are a big user of a project, hire someone to just contribute to the project, for example. Interesting, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, because yeah, that, yeah, because then you are using financial resources to provide those crucial development hours, contributions, right. features, and whatnot. Because mm -hmm. also you are likely, if you are a big user of the project, you are likely also going to be the one who's asking for new features. Yeah, pressing against the edges exactly. of what you can do. So then you can actually be like, hey, I'll, I'll get this person working on this yeah. so that we can actually get these features as well. Mm -hmm. And that is um, that is an existing model of that people use also within the cloud native ecosystem. Yeah, like in the end, it's always that. money involved. Yeah, like, exactly. Mm -hmm. You've got to pay your people one way or the other. Exactly. Whatever they may be working on. And it, it's cheaper to pay someone to contribute to a Kubernetes tool than it is to write that tool yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a good, it's a good mix either yeah. way. It's fun talking with them though. I know if you feel like a lot of people who do this and it's like you ask them like, Oh, what do you do? And they're like, Oh, I work for this company, but actually I only do contributions to this open source project. So like, you know, uh -huh. you pick and choose which one I like work for per right. se. Yeah. Um, quote unquote, but you know, um, I have depends. that problem. People yeah. say, what do you do? I say, how much time do you have? <laughs> you mean, yeah. what do I do for money? 
Well, what do you do for fun? What, what do you do spend your most of the time I like on? To do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, work for versus work on, right? Right. Yeah. Both, both are very reasonable. Uh, I just don't know what I want to be when I grow up. That's the problem. Why well, start now? That's not <laughs> even a thing. <laughs> not even funny. <laughs> what, what's that about? <laughs> I'm not starting that now. That's not yeah. a good idea at all. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we haven't talked about security at all. I don't, know if I, I don't even know if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. And it, well, anytime that you take a piece of your monolith and split it off into another service, mm. you have to think about security. Mm-hmm. And Very true. yeah. Some of that you, about. Yeah. You may have, you may be using the same authentication methods that you're using on your monolith, but oftentimes you're not. Hmm. So yeah, and there's a lot of good tooling that you can snap from the CNCF uh, uh-huh. landscape there as well. Like the new, well, not the new ones per se. It's always a bit of like, is it a new one or not? Because some people Kubernetes is new, and for some people, mm-hmm. you know, the Sandbox project, like, oh, it's old news. Right. Um, but there's Falco, for example, um, which is real time threat detection that you can use as well and whatnot. So there's a lot of things you can plug into from the add-on. But again, as as, as I stress. Actually, use the ones that make sense for you. Yeah. Right. Um, but Fair. within my session, I will do like here in this event, for example, I will do a bit of off Falco and whatnot. So I do. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, the cloud platform, like if you're using functions, dictates what kind of you yeah. know, mechanism you're going to use. But you know, of course, if you have your containers, you can use whatever you want. Exactly. Exactly. Another reason you might go that way, right? Is right. You have specific security constraints, and yep. the automatic stuff is not going to do it for you. So it just gives you more choice. Exactly. I'll include a link to Falco. It looks interesting. Just so we've talked about security enough, we can move on. <laughs> yeah. Checkbox so done. Checkbox. <laughs> Next. Yeah. Of course, we talked about security. We always like talking about security. It's our favorite. Developers thing. love security. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, here's some constraints. Have fun. Yeah. I mean, there's no way to work in containers where you don't have security rules already in place. Like that's yeah. just the name. I mean, we talk about this whole shifting left of the mm-hmm. security side. It's like, these are the tools that shift you left. You're using it no matter what. So you might as well, you know, get comfortable with it and you don't have to retrofit it either. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I actually recently heard like a good anecdote and I think it's probably a very well known one um, for security and for example, for policy management, which is, you know, a great, the key burner as well from, from CNCF for policy mm-hmm. management and security on that front. Um, so, like, as, as you kind of hear, like, you don't have to think about security or policy management as, you know, the bombers who are going to, you know, come and limit you. You can think about yeah. them as guardrails yeah. Yeah. that work. Like, if you're driving in a steep cliffy area, for example, they're the guardrails that actually stop you from going over the hill, yeah. from going over the cliff. Mm-hmm. So, you can actually go faster if you have good guardrails that are well thought out mm-hmm. in place. So that then you can, you know, speed as much as, well, not as much as you want, but like <laughs> a bit faster because you don't have to worry about no, no. things so much. You're so they are, dri- you're driving yeah. by Braille. Just bounce along that guard. Right? No <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but like, you know, you can use them as the guidelines, the guard lines so that you can actually kind of well, do it's, more. You know, you speak to the right thing, which is what I'm doing is keeping you from being the code that caused the breach. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. That by incorporating this the whole time and checking it the entire time. You don't have the vul- the code vulnerability that would eventually turn into an exploit for the company. Yeah, for you sure. don't anyway. I mean, things move. Nothing's ever certain, but at least try. <laughs> yeah, <know? laughs> yeah, to some degree. Sure. So, what's next for you? What's in your inbox? Oh, there's so many things. So, there's uh, the fall conference season is picking up right now. Mm-hmm. I'll be in um, KCD, Washington D.C. in mm-hmm. a few weeks. And uh, just yesterday, the KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, um, North America uh, program for this year was released and it's going to be in Chicago. And I'll be speaking there as well. Nice. Nice. Um, very looking forward to that as well. Um, and there's a bunch of other conferences that I'm doing. And in addition to, you know, I have, I should maybe do a few more episodes of my podcast and. Yeah. I'm thinking Tell us about, about the podcast. When oh, did that start? It's been, oh, we started in 2018, I think. Right. So it's been a bit, but now being like a bit of in a hibernation for like a year ish or so, mm-hmm. but we should maybe kick it back on. Um, we started the first season by having essentially like, actually we did like scripted episodes into what are containers, mm. how to choose, you know, how to buy a cloud and whatnot. So like very like, actually, well, not that interviews aren't educational, but like very like, very foundational. deep, exact foundational yeah, yeah. details, everything scripted. So every single 
sentence provided something new to attendees and we got so much good feedback from very like beginner level people Mm -hmm. they were very happy with the first season but then honestly it was a bit too time confusing consuming because it took like 30 hours to make like you know 15 minutes of training material exactly so then the second season um we did um or or, or the seasons after that we've done like as interview formats similar to this um podcast as well but now i should maybe revive it but i'm also thinking about other stuff as well i should start kind of i'm just trying to get this my head around this idea of you can hibernate a podcast what what would that be like (laughs) i can't even imagine if it happens it will happen very organically you just notice oh we didn't yeah. do an episode for a year whoopsie <laughs> what should i, I do have now a podcast like that yeah. yeah we have we we do episodes not this one but we do yeah. episodes when there's something to talk about mm-hmm. exactly and if there isn't anything to talk about why well, talk about it yeah, yeah sure enough but like as far as what i try i'm trying to add to my inbox or like what i'm actively adding as as i go forward i'm thinking about things like maybe a book or um or training series or mm-hmm. or content video creation or something because i'm i've been doing now international conferences for a few years already and i last year for example did 30 conferences per year mm-hmm. which is a lot um so i'm trying to do other stuff as well conferences are great but i think i want to do something a bit more long form as well because right. conference sure. session is it's great but it's quite short lived yeah, it you, happens you and carving that's up it. your whole life into one hour sessions right? <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly right. so that's next yeah, um that's great yeah. well thanks it's been great talking to you perfect thank you for having me absolutely and we'll talk to you dear listeners next time on .net rocks .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a... <laughs>